Welcome to the Chronic Hope Institute podcast, the only podcast designed for the families of those who are struggling with addiction and codependency. If addiction has rocked your household and you don't know where to turn to get support, then this podcast was built for you. Our host has written the book on how families can navigate the scary world of addiction. Chronic Hope, Parenting the Addicted Child, and Chronic Hope, Families and Addiction can both be found on Amazon today. We invite you to connect with us on Facebook, as well as subscribing to the Chronic Hope Institute podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, here is your host, author, therapist, and CEO of the Chronic Hope Institute, Kevin Peterson. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today at the Chronic Hope podcast on Monday, September 20th, 2021. Um, and we are really excited today to have an amazing uh, guest to talk about uh, detox, et cetera, et cetera. His name is Steve Carlton, <laughs> which I, I've had a little fun with trying to beat into my head because it was Carlton, 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 and I just sat there and repeated his name backwards and forwards. Steve, how are you today? Doing great. It's so good to be with you. Hey, man. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you here. and. Um, we're, what we want to talk about today is what do we do if we think one of our family members has a drug or alcohol problem? But before we go down that path, would you mind giving us a little bit of background about sort of who you are and where you come from, what you do, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. Yes, I'm Steve Carlton. I'm the executive clinical director at Gallus Detox, or a medical drug and alcohol detox facility. A little bit about my background. In addition to Gallus, I'm also a professor in the... Um, uh, graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver. Um, and prior to my experience at Gallus, I spent 10 years uh, treating addiction and trauma with, uh, with veterans at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And prior to that, I was doing in-home family therapy with, um, with actually with court-ordered families uh, with an identified substance use um, problem. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Wow. <laughs> I, that, that last part, I didn't know. I, you and I share that together. I did that too. <laughs> That's uh, my, my first job out of graduate school was working for Arapahoe Douglas Mental Health on the uh, crisis response team. And part of that program was going into the homes and, and doing work in the homes, uh, which was amazing. Absolutely incredible. It's, yeah, it's fantastic work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think I'm sure I, I'm sure you and I probably feel exactly the same way in the sense that if you really want to impact change in the family system and in the individual, you got to get into where they live, not have them come to you once every two weeks. Yeah, you can. yeah. going to them, take it, take that access problem away from them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Remove the obstacles. Exactly. All right. So today's topic is what do we do if we think one of our family members has a drug or alcohol pr uh, problem? And in my books, I have sort of prescribed what we call um, Plan A, which is we set boundaries, accountability, and structure in three categories. The you know drugs and alcohol being the primary one, and we try it and you know hold them hold the the loved one accountable with love and empathy, but still having boundaries. Uh, and and drugs and alcohol work uh, or school, and then the final category is behavior at home. And we give plan A generally about a 30 day run and see how it goes, depending on what it is they're using. Um, but then if that doesn't work, then we go straight to what we call plan B, which is intervention and treatment. And, and that's kind of where you come in. Um, so let's say we do the intervention. Um, at what point should someone be considering detox? I think uh, detox is, is sort of the first step for a lot of people. Okay. And so I think you're considering detox when it becomes apparent that the drug and alcohol use, quitting on their own without support is not going to be sustainable. Um, that withdrawals are commonly sweating, um, anxiety, uh, cravings, sort of those are sort of the, the initial ones that people can't stop because those things become so overwhelming and uncomfortable. And so you would call detox and get them in with us. And from there, um, you, you identify next steps. And so if we have the family and the interventionist and they're, they're doing the intervention and the intervention, let's say goes well, um, 
and and I'm sure you know I want I want to our audience tends to be the family members of sort of like wondering what do we do and how do we do it and what's this going to look like. Who makes that call? Who is it? The interventionist is it? They've identified a treatment center and they call the treatment center. How do they decipher whether or not they should call you first? Sure, I, I think when people have severe withdrawals, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, like they're they're really sweaty, they're sort of having those delirium tremens if it's alcohol, um, that we should be the first call. Uh, we know that, that withdrawals from substances are a lot of times the biggest barrier to people engaging. There's so much fear around those symptoms that people don't want to go to treatment because they're terrified of how badly they're going to feel. And so we would be the first call on that end. Um, a lot of times residential facilities, if you start there, the admissions people will identify with the patient that the withdrawals are bad enough that they need to come to a place like Gallus and get that medical stabilization uh, before okay. they go on and can engage meaningful in, in, in therapy and other interventions. Gotcha. So what I hear you saying is that, so now I'm on, now I've done an intervention and now I'm on the phone and I'm calling my local treatment center and I've gone through the insurance qualification process. And now the admissions person at the treatment center is going to sort of walk me through and, and get the severity concept. And, and mm -hmm. then, it be, then it becomes, they're going to help me find you. The vast majority of the time, that is how it happens. I don't, for family, I think the message there is that they don't, they don't need to do that assessment work. You can leave that part to the experts. And, and that, that really is our job and our admissions people's job to ask those specific okay. questions about whether or not detox is indicated. When it is, it's usually pretty obvious that yeah. the withdrawals are really the barrier to somebody going to treatment because you're going to hear that from your family member or loved one. I, I know that I, in my client base, um, that tends to be one of the things that with someone who's using benzos or opiates or mm -hmm. uh, heroin uh, or, or meth, methamphetamine, um, that tends to be one of the biggest uh, arguments against going to treatment is I'm, I'm not going to go through the withdrawal process. Yeah, exactly. And I think what Gallus does better than most is for opiates in particular, the, the withdrawals, people feel like they're going to die, right? And if yeah. they've had treatment experiences and they've been that uncomfortable, there, there is some legitimate fear around, are these people going to treat me with dignity are they going to listen to me when i'm telling them i'm desperately sick and and in gallus we do listen to that and and we're proactive in our in how we detox people so we make people much more comfortable than most uh, even through that really difficult process of detox you know i actually just la i mean i'm not kidding that just last week that was one of the i was on the phone with uh, a, a woman and, and the person that she was trying to talk into going to treatment. And that was exactly the argument from the, the, the young woman that was struggling with alcohol detox was they're not going to treat me right. I've gone to the ER before I've gone through detox. This is, I'm not going to be, you know, uh, I'm not going to have that stigma. I'm not going to have that shame attached to me. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. So that's, a, that's critical. And I think a good question that uh, that family and the person struggling can ask is how do, how do you all do detox? Is it proactive, right? Are you proactively staying ahead of those withdrawal symptoms, or are you waiting until people get sick before you're medicating and, and helping them? Ah, yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so. The next thing I get from families is, okay, once I've, we've introduced the concept of detox, then they come back at me um, and they're asking me, okay, so now I'm seeing things about a social detox and a medical detox. And can you define those two and the differences and what you guys do at Gallus? So I'll start with what's, what's the same about social and, um, and medical detox is it's, it's usually designed to be an assessment phase. When you're coming into detox, you let the professionals and the experts at those places do that assessment and determine like what is going to be a good fit for a residential or uh, or a treatment program that's outpatient. Um, and social detox, there's typically not there's there's not medication involved, right? That is 
really just a holding place for someone to go and to, mm-hmm. to have a safe place for them to be. Um, okay. A lot of times it's either jail or social detox. Medical detox is very much like you're coming in and, and we are immediately starting to treat you for withdrawals. We know that you have withdrawals and, and, and so we're going to start addressing those immediately when you hit the door. And, and what, so what would, I mean, again, remembering our audience doesn't, doesn't live in the world that you and I live in. What is Gallus? And, and, you know, uh, when, when somebody calls and asks that question, what, what, what are, what is Gallus? Gallus is medical detox. And so okay. all of our providers at Gallus are actually mostly trained in the emergency department. So when people okay. come in, we're immediately putting in an IV and we're pushing okay. fluids and pushing medications to make people comfortable, right? Because what we know is that if people are going through detox and they're really uncomfortable, their chances of staying are very low. So if you come to a place like Gallus, we just get ahead of those withdrawals and people stay comfortable. And then and then they, they typically make a better decision about going into treatment. And that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Cool. You want people to yeah. continue on. Yeah. Awesome. So so now going down the path, you we've I've brought my loved one to you. You've put the IV in, you've started to treat them proactively. Me as the family member, what should I expect? What 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 do you want from me? What kind of participation or engagement are we gonna have? And, and as a family member, how do I support my loved one in detox? Absolutely. So when when your loved one hits detox, especially at Gallus, there's usually a 24-hour period where we're just trying to stabilize and make people comfortable. Um, and in that process, um, family can be as involved as the, the loved one allows them, right? So if they sign a release of information, typically um, myself or someone on my team, a clinical director is calling them, giving them updates, sort of telling them what's happening. Um, and then the loved one will be invited uh, to, to be a part of that next step process, right? To be a part of that, that identifying what programs are out there that are going to be a good fit for this person. And so being a part of that process um, is really essential. Yeah, that was actually one of the follow-ups I was going to say is, so let's say that we, we, we haven't picked out a treatment center, um, mm-hmm. but we know that the first thing we need to do is get them, like you said, physically detoxed. Um, is that something you can help us with? It, 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 with the, yes, with the identifying the program after? Yes, yep. that is mm-hmm. our primary goal and function is trying to get that person into next steps. I think the most important thing your viewers should understand, and you know this, Kevin, but the only predictor of success in recovery from substances is days in a recovery environment. So the more connected that person is, the higher chances of success, right? Yeah, well, which, I mean, God, it's like you've read my questions. <laughs> You're leading me perfectly into the next one, which is, what is the average stay in a detox facility? And, and again, as a family member, what should I expect on length of stay? Yeah, for alcohol at Gallus, we are pretty quick. So we ha- we it's an average length of stay of three days for people with alcohol use disorders. Um and a lot needs to get done in that three days to get them connected <laughs> to the next step. With opiates, you can expect people are going to stay seven or eight days. Um, ah. And, and that, it, that's a little bit longer of a process because of just the nature of those withdrawals and how, how opiates affect people. And was it, I'm guessing that it's the same for benzodiazepines as well and prescription medications. Benzodiazepines are really pretty tricky um and they that can be up to 10 to 14 days depending on how long and how how severe that is um benzodiazepines can can perhaps be the trickiest they and it's also important to know those are the most life-threatening the most dangerous uh, of all the all the substances that we deal with in detox which is, oh my gosh, which, I mean, which is kind of a bonus follow-up question to that is the significance and why it's so critical to use a detox facility as opposed to trying to do it yourself. So uh, 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 fill in the blanks there. Yeah. Why, is it, why, why, is it more, why is it good to go to a detox center instead of like, I'm just going to taper down myself? 
For, for alcohol and benzodiazepines, those two substances, the withdrawals from them can be life-threatening. And what, okay. what a lot of people don't know with alcohol, the big the, the time frame where it's most dangerous is actually 36 to 72 hours after your last drink. People sort ah. of expect that it's that first 24 hours. It's actually delayed where you're in that biggest danger zone of having seizures. And with benzos, it's actually three to five days after your last dose and so it's a, it's a really sort of delayed period where those can be really dangerous and that's why doing it at home is not a good idea yeah that that situation i was telling you about last week that was the uh mm -hmm. The argument that the uh, the alcoholic person was presenting, well, no, I can handle this myself. I just need, you know, da 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 da. And the advice I was giving uh, her loved one was, yeah, no, she needs to go to detox. And you know, she doesn't. I'm sorry, I, I know you love her, but she doesn't get to make those decisions. You know, mm -hmm. she's not a she's not a Steve Carrollton expert. You know. <laughs> right. oh. yeah. <laughs> Did it again. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a lot for people to wrap their head around, right? That yeah. that that stopping the substance can put my life in danger. That's very counterintuitive because the goal yeah. of family is to get them to stop, and so understanding stopping too fast and stopping at home is is putting yourself in a worse situation in some ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, hey. What trends have you seen um, during the pandemic? Because um, I, I know I've been I've talked a lot to uh, folks about um, the fact that everyone's been isolated and things have definitely been exciting and interesting. But I'm curious on your end, uh, what have you seen during the last year and a half? Yeah, it's, it's really been interesting. Things have started to shift a little bit in terms of um, a, a couple things: alcohol and opiates. With alcohol people that were sort of teetering on that line and, and that quote unquote functional alcoholic, right. Where they would wait until <laughs> five, 5 PM after work um, to start drinking. I think when you're at home, sort of, I think that bottle calls to people earlier and earlier in the day. So we've just seen people go from sort of a relationship with alcohol that wasn't healthy, but they were still fulfilling some obligations to, now they're having a drink in the morning to stave off shakes. The other thing is fentanyl. I mean, fentanyl is, that's that's the big one right now that um, we're, we're losing a lot of people to. And, and I think the biggest thing there, and I don't know if this is COVID related or not, but um, on the streets, dealers are pressing pills that look like a Xanax or look like an Oxy or... Um, and, and really what's happening is they're taking fentanyl and people do not realize it. A lot of people yeah. come in thinking I'm taking Xanax. We do a drug test and there's fentanyl and they're, they're, they're very confused and scared. Which again, is an even more, uh, another reason to be engaged in a professional detox environment, medical detox environment, because you guys are going to pick that sort of stuff up and treat it appropriately, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Yeah, if you don't know what you're detoxing from, then you know that's that's sort of a, that's that's a problem, and that's that's happening a lot. Yeah. Wow. This has been awesome. I, I really appreciate all, all the information. Give me some last thoughts. What? Uh, tell me what have what have we not talked about, or you know, tell me anything else. I think what I see a lot in my work, Kevin, and I know you do this all day, every day, but it's just helping families with the fear, right? There, there's so much fear around this and there's, and it's so hard to know what direction to go in, right? I think the question I get most often from family is just, what do I, what do I do? Like, you know, tell me what to do here, right? And I think that there's lots of different right answers, right? And, and I think helping people find the answer and the boundaries and the and the way they're going to navigate that that feels feels right for them um, that that they they do have options there are things that are within their control whether or not their loved one continues to use or not not necessarily within their control but your own behavior the own, the way that you're interacting and and and, and addressing it you you do have control over that and. Um, and I think that's that's one thing that you you get help for when you seek it, right? Is is sometimes the help is more for the family than it is 
for the person struggling with the addiction and and that's okay and that's necessary I, and i yeah and unlike you know you and i have both have done so much you know family work and in-home family work that sometimes that's how the whole process starts is actually mm-hmm. getting the family to get on board and say hey we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to take care of ourselves. And if you choose to continue down your path of substance abuse, that's your choice, but we're going to start holding boundaries. I mean, I know for a fact that uh, in, in 1990, my dad, that's what he did with me. He's like, look, so you're my only son and I love you, but yeah. we're done, you know, no more. And, and mm-hmm. that's what started the whole process. And it's such a hard thing to do. The other thing I think families should know is that even if somebody is sort of pushed or shoved into treatment, that can be effective, right? It, it doesn't matter sort of the, the, the agent for change or the reason somebody gets to treatment. It actually doesn't matter. Statistically, whether somebody is forced into it or they choose it of their own volition, outcomes are identical. I mean, that, then that's, that's also important to know. So when they are having to set those boundaries and do those hard things, you're giving your family member a shot, right? Even though it yeah. can kind of get ugly, you're giving them a chance, an opportunity. And that's, that's kind of, that's the point. Hey, Kevin, we have a, uh, we have a question from the audience on our Facebook live uh, that I think you both could probably help with. Um, okay. So I'm going to put it on screen here for you guys. Can you read that, Kev? Sure. It says, I think my, it's from Carrie, I think my loved one is going through this and I'm not sure how to approach the conversation with them. Can you help me? Uh, can you help guide me? So Steve, why don't you take a shot at it first and then I'll, then I'll jump in. Absolutely. So just uh, with the approach of the conversation is, is, is what I'm guessing she's asking there. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, I think compassion, you lead with compassion if somebody is starting to thinking about it, like that is started, that is starting the change process. And what you can do there is, is just approach them, not with solutions, but more of like, how can I help you? Like, I want to help you with this. I want to work together with you on this. Like if they're already thinking about it, that means there's already some type of traction there. And I think, and then you can get on the phone the recovery community is really a beautiful thing because even if you even if you get on the phone with the wrong person, chances are they can point you in the right direction, right? Yeah. And so getting your loved one on the phone with somebody and, and doing that together, like if, if they will let you do that, that's a great place to start, I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if we have a family member that's like voluntarily saying, hey, I, I have a problem and I need help. You know, I, that's definitely a fantastic thing. And even if it's something uh, that Carrie may be saying is, how do I bring it up to someone that that I'm concerned about? I think that like it's the same thing. You you treat it with empathy, love, and compassion. Um, and I think you also toss in you know some boundaries as well, and saying, hey, you know, I love you, and I care about you, and I'm worried about you, and 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 I think we need to get some help. And, and, you know, be willing to en- engage in that slightly uncomfortable conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, great. Great. And we had another question, Kev, that, that I can't put on screen, but it's, it's on another channel. It's, is detox, cover- detox covered by insurance? Great question. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Steve. So the, uh, I, it, it depends on your insurance plan. Right. And so I think the first thing you can do, and this is what a lot of people don't know, is they start by calling their insurance company and then they, they that can just go on forever. And so one of the main things that Gallus and other rehab facilities can do is you get on the phone and that person, you, you, you give them your insurance information. They do what's called a verification of benefits and that admissions person will look at your insurance plan they're going to be experts in what's covered and what's not and they can call you back after doing that and tell you this is covered this isn't covered um here's what you can expect and and so it's it's better to do that with a facility than with an insurance company is what i'll tell you 100 percent agree and i happen to know the director of admissions at gallus emily schrader who is so awesome and so amazing and and uh she's just an incredible person and does an incredible job as well as and i'll be in big trouble if i don't throw a shout out to my girl laura herman as well 
yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> who is your what director of marketing, director of business development? Yeah, she's our yeah, chief of business development. Mm-hmm. Chief, okay. chief. Oh my God. Chief. Okay. She's chief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, which which tells I would just the thing I would say is that you guys mm-hmm. have such great staff and and they do such a great job and and you know what's interesting is that um, from a personal experience is that I. Uh, we we had a situation a year ago where we worked with you uh, for a, a, a love fa- a loved one in our family that uh, and you guys did an amazing job and took great care of her and so you know we're we're very very grateful so I definitely have some personal experience with you so all right and, well and Kev know. sorry we have we have one more question and it's not pulling up on screen but I'm gonna let you know what the question <laughs> is uh, okay. um, and you both can an- you both can help this person live. Uh, this person essentially is saying that they've, their, their loved one has been to detox multiple times. Uh, they feel like it's been a, a way to get them to shut up or not worry about them anymore. They just go to detox, but then they don't follow through with treatment. Uh, so their question is along the lines of what to do when your loved one's been to detox multiple times and it doesn't seem like they're ready to change their life and they're not, they're worried they're not going to take detox seriously the next time. You this, go first. This is, yeah, this is sort of what we do at Gallus. A lot of people um, that, that come to us have had many, many bad experiences in detox. And uh, unfortunately, that there's, there's, there's some facts behind that, right? And so at Gallus, it, we are different because we're proactive in treating withdrawals, right? And so when, when, when you can get, if you can get that loved one on the phone with somebody at Gallus, they can go through that process. The other thing that Gallus does really great with is we provide something called motivational interviewing every day while they're in our detox. And because they're feeling better in that process and they're feeling more hopeful and confident, maybe it can be different this time. Usually you can get better traction and get them connected to aftercare um, where and, and that's kind of where things typically fail in other detoxes is they're miserable. They just can't wait to get out of there. And, and yes, exactly. And I would say that um, in the process, and I, and I know you guys do this, in the process of bringing the loved one to detox as the initial step in the continuum of care is working with the family and planning what the next step is going to be. Because, I mean, I have to tell you, I hear this all the time. Oh, they went to treatment. I'm like, oh, really? Where'd they go? Oh, they went for five days to this place. I'm like, okay, that wasn't treatment. That was detox, which is great. But treatment is generally starts at a 30 day engagement. So when my families that I work with, um, you know, what I let them know is that, okay, detox is the great first step. I'm glad you've got them there. But now it's our chance to prepare ourselves for that next step and holding the boundary of saying, okay, the next step for you is to go into this treatment program and we're not going to, you know, you're not coming home. That's not going to happen. You know, we're going to hold, we love you, but we're going to hold the line. Like you said earlier, number of days in engaged in recovery. That's what, that's, what's critical. So, right. yeah. Absolutely. And then I think when they're in Gallus, they're, they're, con- we can connect family with, people like you, Kevin, and, and, and me and my clinical directors, we also can sort of help family set those boundaries as well. And so it just opens up um, for more sort of avenues of help and support when they come to come to a place like Gallus. And one more plug there. I mean, with at Gallus, 85% of our patients that come through Gallus go into aftercare. They have some yep. type of next step identified. And that, that's exactly, that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Cool. All right, Danny, before I try to, to end, are, anything else? We're good to go. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's great to have questions and great to have the engagement. And, and Steve, I'm so grateful for your time and, and for the knowledge and the information. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. Okay. So thanks for tuning in again uh, this week to uh, the Chronico podcast, the only podcast that is designed to help families that are struggling with addiction and codependency. And, you know, if you get a chance, please go ahead and, you know, write us a review, like us on YouTube, Facebook and and, uh, uh, Apple Podcasts and subscribe. And we'll look forward to catching up with you guys next month.
Thank you for listening to the Chronic Hope Institute podcast with your host, Kevin Peterson. Please join us again next time. We exist to provide support, education, and hope for families who are struggling with addiction and codependency. Remember to connect with us on Facebook, as well as subscribe to the Chronic Hope Institute podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to podcasts. See you again soon.